We're in the midst of a huge transformation where peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, Shakar and Paris, and I am the Senior Partnerships Manager here at All Voices. Today, I am very excited to welcome our next guest onto the interview series, Nick Dugan. He is the Senior Director of Inclusion and Development at Polio. Nick, thank you so much for being here. If you want to share a little bit about yourself, our listeners, including your pronouns, and when you were younger, do you remember how exactly you answered the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah, that's a great question to start with. Thanks so much for having me, Christina. Uh, yeah, my name is Nick Dugan. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I work for Appfolio. I'm based in Santa Barbara in California. And growing up, I, I wanted to be a few different things. One of the stories I like to tell is that in, I think, fourth or fifth grade, one of our teachers assigned us to do a haiku poem about our, uh, our desired career. And I was really into detective novel, novels. I read all the, uh, well, back at that age, it was probably the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew. So I said I wanted to be detective. So somewhere in a scrapbook in my uh, storage unit, I have a haiku about wanting to be a detective. So obviously that didn't quite pan out. Uh, a little bit later, as I got into my, my teenage and college years, I would have said that I wanted to be a graphic designer. I was involved in yearbook in high school and uh, just that ability to be creative, but I'm not really good with you know drawing or, or making art with my hands. So having something that I could be creative and create something that was visually pleasing uh, on the computer where it was where I had the ability to adjust, adjust things was, uh, was something that I really enjoyed. I love that answer. Uh, I feel like you are creating and designing a little bit right now in your in your role at Appfolio. And I you know in our kind of previous conversation, you shared that you helped launch Appfolio's first diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, strategy from scratch, uh, which I would imagine is a lot of work with a capital W. Can you share a little bit about where you started um, and what advice you have for folks who are in a similar boat or position at their organization? Sure, I'm happy to. We started about four years ago, and I have to say it wasn't 100% from scratch. I think most companies aren't starting 100% from scratch. We definitely had employees who had uh, started different programs or leaders who had championed different things. Just as we were growing as a company, when we were smaller, it was something that happened in pockets. We really tried to empower our leaders and teams to do what worked for them, which worked really well when we were a smaller size. Uh, about four years ago, we realized we needed something a little bit more consistent across the company. And so there was a desire kind of at all levels, from employees, from leadership, from the board, to have a more coordinated stance around what diversity, equity, and inclusion looked like at Appfolio. So where we started and where I would encourage others to start is really, first of all, you're not doing this alone. There are people that can help. Uh, this podcast, has, you know, past episodes have many guests, so I'm sure if you reached out to them, first of all, listen to their episodes. They've got some great <laughs> advice. Uh, and I've benefited so much from reaching out to other people who had done this. So I would say that's the first step is really feel free to reach out to others. Um, I benefited a lot from talking to leaders at companies that were kind of in the same peer group as ours. So mm -hmm. people that were in the same uh, locations that we had, people that were in the same industry that we had, just to understand what they were doing. And then also reaching out to experts, finding partners. There are so many people out there who are doing really good DEI work. Uh, a lot of them you can find on LinkedIn and get free advice. And then when you're ready to, to make the plunge and invest in some help, uh, reaching out for that is really helpful. Once you've sort of gained a little bit of understanding of where you're going and sort of built that support system for yourself, I think the number one most important thing is that any significant cultural change, including looking at a DEI strategy, has to start with strong support from the leadership level. Right. And for us, we were lucky because we did have strong support from the leadership level. But it doesn't necessarily mean that all of our leaders were exactly on the same page in terms of their understanding and what they knew about DEI, what they knew was effective. So we really started with that. We contracted with a partner called Ready Set, founded by Wyvon Hutchinson, who has a new book out. I encourage you to check that out. It's called How to Talk to Your Boss About Race. But Wyvon and her team at Ready Set helped us convene some executive conversations to really talk about what are people's different backgrounds on DEI? What are their thoughts about where we've done well as a company and where we might need to improve? And from there, it was really a lot more effective to be able to make that change because once you've got support from the leadership team, things get a lot smoother down the road. We followed that up with an assessment phase. And that's, I think, a really critical, important part of any DEI strategy is to get input from your employees. What are they experiencing? Making sure that you're hearing from all groups of employees. So we added some demographic information to our annual engagement survey so that we could do cuts of the data by uh, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation. 
Uh, we were really pleased. I think it was a nice sign that we got a really high percentage of people willing to disclose those demographic details. Um, so I think that was a nice reinforcement that we had built the trust to be able to have this foundation to build our DEI strategy on. And then we followed that up with interviews, focus groups. We used uh, Ready, Set, again, a third party partner so that people could have that uh, safety to be able to share openly without, uh, without the information going directly to their, to their employer. Um, and so doing all that data gathering and having expert partners and leadership involvement really led to a rich conversation about how do we take all this and really put it a plan in place that is actionable? There is so much to do. I think one of the things we talk about a lot in the DEI space is this is we're not going to solve DEI in a year, right? No company is going to achieve it on their own. This is a you know multi-year uh, project, right? And that's not an excuse for not making change. I think we all need to dive in and look at places where we can drive change, but it is something that is going to take time. And so I think for us and for any company really that's just starting out, I do think it's important to narrow down to a few things where you really believe you can move the needle. I think that's an approach we take it at Folio in general is really narrowing in on places we can make a difference. And so we leveraged that approach for DEI and identified it a few places where we thought we could really uh, move forward. And that has really helped us. That stayed consistent for the last couple of years. So those are the things that I would that I would advise for anyone getting started. Yeah, I appreciate that advice around that holistic perspective of acknowledging where you are, what work has been done today, asking for feedback, having that leadership buy-in as well, because we know that there's that individual onus to change our processes and behaviors tomorrow. But for that systemic change, you need that leadership buy-in uh, as well. And it's definitely a journey. We're not fans of box checking here. It's just we're something we're always cultivating of being inclusive and and creating that equitable work environment as well. And I think these past two years have really taught us that business as usual is out the door and it's a, a really a great time for innovation as well. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've redesigned systems to be more inclusive over the past uh, two years, whether it's a process, policy, or initiative? Yeah, things certainly have changed in the last couple of years. And yet some things are the same, right? We have some of the same challenges and I think they've come even more to light around diversity, equity, and inclusion over the last couple of years. One of the places that we've really been focused is looking at our hiring process. Now, I always like to start this with a caveat that when you're doing DEI work, it's not just about the pipeline, right? It's not just about diversity. It's about creating a, a whole system and adjusting. You, you said some of the, you know, the systemic elements, it's, it's taking that holistic look at the system, making sure that it's an inclusive place that people want to join. Because just looking at your hiring pipeline is not gonna solve the problem. You're gonna bring people in, they're gonna find out that it's not necessarily a place where they can thrive and they're gonna leave. So you do have to look at it holistically. That said, hiring and diversity and representation is an important puzzle piece to the broader DEI project. So one of the areas we've really focused on there is looking at how can we engage our entire employee and company community in this process. Because one of the things we heard early on was, I want to hire more diverse teams, but I'm not sure how, right? Or I'm waiting for our talent acquisition team to tell me what to do. And one of the things that we know is true, and I think this is true for a lot of companies, it's certainly true for ours, is that a huge percentage of our hires come through employee referrals. Now, that's whether or not you have a formal program. Yeah. Uh, people talk about where they work. It's a great place to work. You should come work here. And what that means is that we tend to bring people into the company that are from our networks. And in many cases, that means people that look like us, right? If you look at your professional network, I can certainly admit for myself, before I started this work, my network was fairly homogeneous. And so when I would refer to friends, it was often people who had similar backgrounds to myself. Right. So one of the ways we've tried to innovate here is to give everyone tools that they can bring in more diversity. We, have, we are launching a series called Diversify Your Network which is really trying to make it something that there are simple ways that anybody, no matter what their position in the organization, whether they're a manager or a individual contributor, whether they're a leader or just someone that is interested in bringing you know, awareness to what we're doing at Epfolio, that they have some skills and tools to be able to help with our project of bringing in more diverse talent. So we worked with a partner, uh, her name is Marietta Gentles Crawford. She wrote a really amazing article in The Muse uh, a year or two ago that was basically exactly about this around how do you diversify your network. So she's built a training for us. We're in the process of piloting it right now, but it's very practical. It really is about understanding that, first of all, these are things that we can talk about, right? One of the things that I've run into is, and, and there are phases, and I think we've, as a, as, a, as a culture, moved a little bit more forward. I think things like the murder of George Floyd and the heightened awareness of 
things that are happening in the country in many different areas in terms of anti-Asian violence, uh, things against Latinx communities, against trans communities. That is becoming a lot more apparent in the public sphere. So we're aware that these things are happening. Um, so we're much more aware of the issues impacting different communities that we interact with and people that are in our companies or, or working with our companies. And so I think one of the things that I saw was that people start out being a little bit hesitant about talking about diversity. Is this really something that's okay to say? They're hesitant because they don't wanna say the wrong thing or not be inclusive. And then we kind of get comfortable talking about diversity, but then we still use pretty generic terms. We talk about diversity, we talk about underrepresented talent, but we don't talk about the particular needs of black employees or Latinx candidates or LGBTQ people. And part of the diversifier network really is getting comfortable with it's okay to look for a black engineering organization and join it and stay abreast of what's going on in that space to learn what is life like in engineering for black people? What is it like for trans people who are trying to work in the tech industry? And so the Diversifier Network uh, training is really about helping people understand that it's okay to engage, it's okay to go out there and really give them the practical tools of here's exactly what you do. Go on LinkedIn, find a group, that is you know, a great thing that I always tell people to, to look, and I learned this from Marietta, who we're working with, is type in multicultural and the name of your function. So multicultural marketing, multicultural HR, and you'll see a number of different groups that are a great place to start to understand what's going on. So we're just getting started uh, with that process, but I'm really excited about it and hoping that that will really, again, it's not the only thing. All these things work together in, in tandem to create change, but I am excited to, to see the results of that, uh, of that program. Yeah, diversifying your network is really important, especially when we're talking about referral programs, whether there is a formal one in place or not. You're right that we're talking to family, friends, our, our, you know, our former coworkers all the time about where we're working today as well, and really giving people the tools, resources, um, and clear best practices on how to do that is really important as well. Um, and that's one part of the picture as you were talking about inclusive hiring, everybody really raising a hand to be part of that process. Uh, when you fast forward to someone joining an organization, one of the major kind of touch points they have is with their with their manager, whether they are a great manager or whether they're starting to build that relationship. How have you helped craft really impactful manager programs to facilitate leaders to craft their own authentic leadership style, right? So not out of the box. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate that question because authenticity and leadership is really important to me. There's another siren. It's only the days that I do podcasts when everyone can oh, really? be, uh, sorry. <clears throat> can you ask the question again? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I, <clears throat> I would love to ask, how have you helped really craft really impactful manager programs to facilitate leaders to craft their own authentic leadership style so not out of the box? Yeah, I really appreciate that question. Authenticity and leadership is something that's near and dear to my heart. So I would say there's there's two ways I would talk about it. One is the, the programs that we do, like what are the containers for where we give people the opportunity to develop their authentic, uh, yeah, authenticity and authentic leadership style, and then how do we go about that? So we have a number of programs for leaders and managers at different levels. Uh, we actually are launching tomorrow uh, a program we call Leader Lab, which is our signature kind of mid-level leader development program. So it's for directors and above. Uh, and it's a three-day, uh, half-day virtual series. We used to do it in person, so we're still kind of navigating that, that transition back to a hybrid environment. But it really gives leaders a space to connect with their peers outside of work. So they're able to step away. They're able to do some work on their leadership style, what they'd like to develop, share it with others. We do a lot on strategy development. We have senior leaders, including our CEO, come and talk about the company vision and strategy. We talk about how to lead change, business acumen. So it's a really comprehensive, uh, exciting program. And then we have opportunities for them to stay connected for uh, 12 weeks after the program. One of the ways that we build authenticity into that program is by having them do the Clifton Strengths Assessment, or it used to be called Strengths Finder, and then share that with their group and really weave that in. I think tools like Strengths Finder, there's, there's lots of them out there. Um, but that one in particular, I think, is helpful for just doing some self-reflection and understanding what are my strengths and how might that be different from someone else's. So one of the things we do during the Leader Lab program is we ask participants to come and do the Strengths Finder, or, or now it's called Clifton Strengths Assessment, so they can understand what their strengths are, what do they bring, and how might that be different than someone else brings to leadership. 
we have them do a 360 assessment in advance, getting feedback from uh, all the people around them. And then we also have what we call a personal inventory. So they have a chance to reflect on what matters to them, what's important. And so they bring all that to this workshop and we put them into uh, small groups of three that they're in throughout the program. And it gives people a really uh, opportunity to create that safe space with a smaller group and, and work with some of these things of how do I bring my authentic self to my work, both in terms of the things that get sparked through the 360 and through StrengthsFinder, as well as through whatever is, is coming up from them. Uh, we do similar things in our manager workshops. We have a program called Managing It at Folio that's, uh, again, a cohort program. New managers go through that for, for eight sessions. We do StrengthsFinder with them as well. Yeah. And I think the other thing that I would say is just really about our, our philosophy that's baked into all of our leadership programs is the idea that there's no one right way to be a leader. And we talk about this at the beginning of our programs, that our goal really is to help employees, uh, help leaders become the best leaders they can be, to leverage their strengths, their styles uh, in, the, in the way that feels right to them. And there's no one right way to do that. So I think that's something that gets infused throughout our programs. I think that is definitely important to remember as well. There's no one right and wrong way to do something as well. And having that growth mindset, having these containers and resources for people to really reflect on their strengths and also see where there's overlap to any cohort-based learning is, is really important. And when we're talking about these investments in manager programs, really the, the programs and the initiatives around diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, I think there's always a question, whether it's webinars or just these one-on-one -on -one conversations around measuring progress. How do we know that we're doing a good job? And, and you know, at the beginning of this conversation, we, we said that this is an ongoing journey. It's not a, it's not a destination, not a multi-year approach. What is your philosophy around measuring um, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives uh, and strategies? Yeah, I think it's similar to most other programs. First of all, you have to have some way to measure it, right? And I think what I, what I sometimes see is that people won't get their work started because they aren't sure how to measure it. Yeah. So I live by the 80-20 rule, right? Like how can you get 80% of the way there if the metrics aren't perfect or you don't have the infrastructure to get the exact data that you want? Don't let that stop you from choosing a place to start and measuring what that might look like. We do a lot of, uh, you know, facilitated workshops on how to set good goals and smart goals. And one of the things I see sometimes is people get so into the methodology of setting goals that they let the specifics prevent them from just getting started, right? right. So I think that's sort of the balance that I try to look at is going back to picking a few things where you can really make a difference, understanding what those are, and then asking yourself, how will we know if this is successful, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, I'll take the Diversify Your Network program as an example, right? In the long term, we want to measure whether that is improving the diversity of our, of our talent pipeline and ultimately the diversity of our talent. Uh, in the shorter term, we want to make sure that everyone has gone through it, right? So I think it's, it's about finding those ways, like the things that you can measure and, and understanding that. Um, I think it's something where you have to constantly be testing and, and learning and improving. Um, and, and it depends on where you're at as a company. I think some companies have very advanced talent analytics. And if you've got that available, you should definitely be taking advantage of that. But for smaller companies who don't have that infrastructure, figure out what you do have, where can you show movement and then start there and then start to build on top of it. Because what I found is when you start someplace, you make progress, even if it's not the ideal thing or there's not alignment on exactly which metrics to look at. If you start somewhere and show progress, that builds support for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Um, and I think the other thing that's important about measurement is not just measuring it for yourself, but being transparent with what's happening. That's one of our focus areas is making sure that we're being accountable as a leadership team and being transparent back to the organization with how are we doing? What progress have we made uh, on the metrics we are tracking? So I think those are the things that I would, I would say about metrics. Yeah, not being afraid to build on top of something, asking for feedback and iterating on that process. But again, like you said, starting somewhere is, is really important, showing that you're actually listening to, to team members as well and really leaning in. I know you kind of talked about how, you know, over the past couple of years as well, um, as a lot of like lived experiences of employees have really surfaced up and there's a lot of um, kind of asks for employers and managers to really have these conversations with folks as well, knowing that we don't check our identity and experiences at the door when we come into work. How does Appfolio really support employees who are experiencing or have experienced trauma from events happening externally in the world? And how do you make sure that all employees have a positive and inclusive experience internally as well? Yeah, 
I would say this is something that we, I think most companies are, are working on. I think we've gotten a lot better at that and I'm happy to share some, some things I think that are, that are helpful. I will also preface it by saying, I think this is an ongoing journey for sure. I think understanding this and understanding the experiences that different people have and how do we uh, adjust our, our work styles and philosophies and approach and managing skills to be able to take that into consideration is an ongoing journey. So we certainly aren't perfect at it. I think most, most companies are not. Um, some of the things that I think we, we do well, um, not necessarily unique to us, but some of the things I think we do, number one is talk about it, right? Being able to acknowledge when things are happening. Um, and it's, it's hard, right? Because I think a lot of companies until a couple of years ago, that wasn't part of their, uh, their thought process, right? It wasn't something that you would acknowledge necessarily events happening outside of the, the company, but really understanding that it's important to say, Hey, we know this is going on, uh, whether it's, um, you know, the George Floyd situation or other killings of black people by police or violence against Asian Americans or violence against trans people or, or, or other situations that are coming up in terms yeah. of the, um, you know, things that are happening out in the world. So I think first of all is, is acknowledging it. And we've, I think done an okay job of putting out communications to acknowledge that. I, I do think it's a challenge sometimes to know in a large company, especially, do you send out an all employee message? Do you talk to the community directly? So again, plenty of opportunities for us to learn, but I think we've, we've leaned into being able to do that of at least acknowledge that it's happening. I think also making it part of our conversation, right? We started providing training to all of our managers two years ago. So we do uh, a, a three session series that's led by our, our partners at Ready Set on understanding DEI, understanding bias, understanding the experience of different communities of color, LGBT communities, um, to really give them that foundational understanding. And then we've also created guides and resources for them to think about how do I connect with and check in with different individuals on my team to understand the impact that they might be feeling from some of these things that are happening out in the world. We also work with Modern Health. Uh, that's a benefit we provide to all of our employees. Uh, and they offer a number of different resources. They offer one-on-one -on -one coaching. They offer self-paced uh, learning and meditation programs, including those that are dedicated to issues around inclusion and belonging. And then one of the resources we've leveraged the most, they have uh, what they call modern health circles, which are community conversations led by a licensed therapist on particular topics around identity and experience. So they have, uh, you know, healing uh, Black trauma or understanding what's happening in the Asian community, and they have that for many different communities uh, based on identity. And then they also have a session on dealing with world events, because there is so much, I mean, we, you know, there, there are all these different things happening in terms of, you, you can draw a line directly to what's happening in DEI, but then there's the pandemic itself. There is political instability. There's what's happening with Ukraine right now. There's so much going on that it does affect people's ability to show up as their best selves and bringing their, you know, their best to, to work, uh, much less being able to thrive in their, in their personal lives. So those are some of the things that we do. I feel like, and then, you know, and then I think a lot of the, the standard things that go into a DEI program are, are employee resource groups, um, having events where people can understand the experience that different people are going through. We will do uh, occasionally when there's a need for it and a community asks for it, we'll host community meetings just to have open spaces for people to talk and learn from each other and get support and share with us, you know, share with, uh, with the leadership team what they're needing. Um, and then of course we have our, our surveys and feedback that we do on a regular basis to make sure that we're open to and understanding how things are changing. Um, so as I mentioned, I think it's something that, that matters a lot and, and something that we'll continue to get better at. Um, I, don't, I don't think we've quite solved the problem of how do we really make sure that we're supporting people 100% with everything that's going on in the world. Um, but I think we've made some good strides and uh, we're, we're still looking for, for uh, ideas and opportunities to improve. Exactly. Acknowledging kind of what's happening, having these hard conversations, leading with vulnerability and empathy. And I love uh, the examples of resources as well with subject matter experts and, and investing in those, uh, creating those spaces for employees too. Is there anything that you wish that more people were talking about in the inclusion conversation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think a couple areas come to mind. I think um, one is one is pretty basic, and I think this will always be true, is just to make sure that we really are being expansive in the voices that we're listening to, right? I think 
different communities have had things that have happened in the world that have made it really clear that it's there's there's an issue and there's something that allies and, and companies and, and others need to to listen to. I think it's important to make sure that that is that is broad, right? I think there are some communities probably that that aren't being heard as much, and and I don't think it's a zero sum game. I think we need to kind of be listening to all of those. So I think, you know, there's probably an opportunity to, for for I mean I will own this for myself. I think these are areas that I can certainly improve on. But for many people, I think understanding the experiences of uh, transgender and non-binary employees, uh, understanding the experience of employees with disabilities, including around accessibility. Yeah. Um, I think there are areas around religion and spirituality that don't come up as often or feel a little bit more sensitive, but that's an important part of many people's identity. So I think talking about those issues that come up, I think class is another one. Yeah. Uh, and of course, all these overlap, right? We talk a lot about uh, intersectionality in DEI. So these are not categories on their own, but I think just making sure that we're thinking about learning about understanding the experiences of all different groups. And I'm sure there are many more that I didn't mention. Um, I think it's also important to make sure that we're being specific in our language. Mm -hmm. I think, again, this goes back to that comfort level of, you know, we've got a, gotten comfortable talking about diverse and underrepresented and, and marginalized, but we still often talk about it as a, as an abstract concept, rather than talking about the experiences of black people or the experiences of Asian and Asian American employees or the experiences of, of gay or trans uh, people. And so I think getting more comfortable um, talking about those experiences, especially for, you know, I mean, I am white and it's been a learning experience for me to be able to be comfortable and feel authentic and not feel like I'm offending anyone. But I, I think that's one of the things that I've learned in my own development is that understanding the needs of a particular community rather than grouping it all together as people of color or underrepresented people is a really important part of being more aware of how we can support different populations. So I think being able to talk uh, more specifically about, about different groups uh, and, and individuals. Finally, I think this is a conversation that's ongoing, so I don't know that it's not being talked about, but I think something we will always need to talk about more is the systemic nature of uh, racism and discrimination and right. bias and how baked in it is to our systems and how in order to truly create change, we have to really dig deep and look more deeply to look at what do we actually need to shift? What do we need to um, make trade-offs? How do I as an individual need to look at my power and privilege and look at how I can use that to not just make it better for the people I work with directly or for the problems that I can see, but actually to shift the system where I have the opportunity to do that. Um, so again, I think that's an ongoing conversation. I think it is coming more into awareness, but that is a really challenging ongoing conversation to make sure that we're looking at things systemically. Yeah, I think those are all important pieces to, to be thinking about as well, thinking about who we're listening to um, and kind of the experiences that we understand, the conversations we're having on day to day. And again, making sure that we are we're learning and having that kind of open mindset. Nick, is there anything that I didn't ask that you want to share with folks who are listening or maybe underscoring a couple of key takeaways that you hope people bring with them after hearing our conversation today? I think you asked great questions, Christine. I think if there was one thing that I would leave people with, it is that doing this work is hard, it's rewarding, yeah. uh, it's important, it's needed, but it's but it's hard. And I, one of the things that I see, especially for companies that are just starting out, is especially for the people that are in the roles that are really pushing this, right? That you measure yourself against companies or organizations that are doing a lot more. So what I would say is, be okay starting with where you're at, right? And by no means is that an excuse. It's not to say like, oh, this little bit that we're doing is enough. <laughs> I feel strongly that you should always have that. You should always be pushing for more. You should always be trying to do more. But doing this work is, is challenging. And many of the people who do this work come from historically marginalized identities and it's emotional labor that people are doing. And so to keep yourself healthy and able to keep contributing to this important work you have to realize when you're doing enough, right? And know that you're doing enough and don't stop, but it's okay to start where you're at, right? Some companies uh, may not have employee resource groups. Starting an ERG is a great place to start. Is that gonna solve every problem? Obviously not, there, there are more things to consider, but start where you can and build on that, I think is okay. I think there's a lot of good conversation out there, especially for companies that have established programs about needing to do more, right? That these things are, not necessarily addressing the systemic issues, 
but it doesn't mean that they're not also important or that it's not an okay place to start. So that is a delicate balance. Uh, and so I think we all need to kind of keep that in consideration of constantly thinking about how can I do more? How can I push the envelope? How can I um, dig deeper into the systemic underpinnings and start creating more transformational change? But at the same time, it's okay to start where you can and build on that. So that's what I would leave folks with. Absolutely. You want to make that sustainable systemic change and really be intentional as well and really taking care of uh, your mental well-being too, because this work is is really hard and it's going to be around for forever and a very long time. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture uh, this afternoon. Thank you for having me. Of course, and under, as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we really believe in employers and employees really being seen, heard, and understood, and we believe that's a requirement for the business to be successful overall. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.